Okay, hi everyone. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. As part of the University of Wolverhampton's Black History Month programme, we have a very exciting day of events that will take us right through to this evening. So if you're able to please stay with us, uh, then, then do so. For the next hour, Dr. Max Stewart, course leader in MA Design and Applied Arts, will be chatting to glass and ceramic artist, Chris Day. If you have any questions, please type them in the Q&A box and we'll go through them at the end of the talk. Welcome both and over to you, Max. Great, thank you, Claire. Welcome everybody and welcome, Chris. Welcome, Max, how are you? Very well, very well. So you're in the second year of an MA. You're fresh from a solo show at the prestigious Vessel Gallery in London. You've received a special commendation at the British Biennale last year. You've just come hot foot from an interview with a journalist on Instagram. How are you doing? You seem to have the world at your feet at the moment. Yeah, yeah, it's um, it's a strange world we're living in, isn't it? Um, Covid aside, it's um, it's been it's been unbelievable. You know, um, I always wanted a, an audience to talk to about this. I didn't think it was going to come so quickly. Um, like you say, I've just come off uh, from talking to Instagram. I've just been talking to Ollie at the White um, House Co Museum. You know, there's so many people interested in not just myself and the work, but I think the experience that I'm going through at this time and uh, all the questions that I want to have answered as well. You know, there's loads of questions through my research and being at university, I still haven't got the answers to and um, still asking them questions. So. Yeah, we're doing all right, but it's to, it is just a whirlwind of um, yeah. I keep pinching myself. Oh, it's day. great. It's great. It's great. Let's put you in context a little for um, our, our viewers. You make glass sculpture from blown glass and ceramic as well, and you also appear to be currently the only black or mixed race glass blower in the UK at this time. Why do you think that is? Um. I think through research and being in this industry for such a short time is that you get a bearing on where you actually sit on this platform. And um, as I've spoke to you and uh, colleagues in the glass industry, you know, Alistair Malcolm, anybody that I meet that's been in this for such a long time, I always ask the question, you know, do you know any other black glass blowers? And the question sometimes, or the answer comes back is that, yeah, there was one. And there's always seems to be there's just one somewhere in the midst of their yeah. memories. And even when you get the names, you can't seem to find or interact or get hold of any of them. So this question, you know, came up uh, various times. Am I the only black glass blower? Because I wanted to I wanted to get in touch with other people similar to myself to find out what their journey was and how they were making as well. You know, what 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 processes lead them to make what they make? But before you can do any of them questions, you've got to find them. And um, it's, been a, it's been a hard task. Now in America, it's totally different. You know, you've got, um, you've got a, a richer culture over there in the glass industry anyway, and you've got a, a higher percentage of people doing it. And that brings the percentage levels of black people doing it up as well. Whereas in the UK, um, I want, I'm not going to say it's a dying art, um, but there aren't a lot of people doing it. And so obviously that percentage then reduces of, of people from ethnic backgrounds doing it. Um, I have found one on the internet and he was doing some work at the Red House Cone a couple of years ago. And his oh, name is Jarde Ford. Okay. Um, I think he was working from Sunderland University, but I put, you know, don't, don't put me down on that one. Um, but um, I've seen his, um, his making on the internet, he's on a YouTube channel as well, and I've tried to get in contact with him with no, with no response. Hopefully, you know, he might see me and he'll, he'll get in contact, but that's the only person in the UK I've actually found of. Now, if there is anybody out there, or if anybody does know anybody, you know, please drop the university or myself the details and I can either get in contact or they can get in contact with me because it's not that I'm like a Black Lives Matter movement and I want to, you know, do a political movement and change the world. It's just a matter of a, another artist getting in contact with another artist and finding out how they feel about the world, where their journey has started from, where it's going, what influences them. 
And it doesn't matter if it's glass, ceramic, or what media, you know, all artists need to sort of like um, collaborate and interact just to get a feedback and to feel to feel where they fit in this art world as well. You know, it's quite a it's quite a harsh establishment, and you need people by your side who can um, back you up and tell you if you're going in the right path. And I feel I haven't, um, I've had, although I've had the university yourself um, and the tutors and all the technicians behind me, one million percent is that you need other artists to give you a bit of a drive. And the only artists I've had are a very few ethnic diverse ones and the majority are white. And although they're sympathetic to the cause and and talking the talk what I'm talking, it's still it'd still be nice just to have that contact. Yeah, I mean the the, the thing about glass making, glass blowing in, in this country is that it does seem to be predominantly white. Yeah. Um, I mean, when I was at Pilchuck five years ago, which is the prestigious glass school in Seattle, um, there was only one black um, artist there. And it was quite noticeable. Um, and I just kind of wonder why, you know, BAME students aren't approaching the subject, really. Um, you know, what, what is it that stops BAME students from coming in and working in glass or ceramics and other materials? Um, I've asked the question myself, and I think to answer it is that you'd need to talk to a lot of people to get that answer. But the, what, the, the one that I've come to is that, first of all, it's that percentage level. So the percentage level actually coming into the universities is very low doing glass and ceramics. So obviously then that's going to be a knock-on effect of the BAME um, community that come in. Because obviously if you've got 10 students and only one of them is is BAME that's that's reducing it and then it's the cost and careers you know if we start at the basics at school and the schools are already their curriculum is solely teaching maths English and the sciences and the arts get you know put to, onto the back burner really and it's not really that encouraged yeah. so even if you've got somebody who really wants to do it say there's another 10 students at school that want to do something and they and there's only one that actually does art then the actual amount that are coming into the establishment isn't there so the first port of call is the schools you know and and even if they do start to teach art are they mixing it up are they encouraging students to look at ethnic diverse artists or have they got a regime and I've I'm, I'm, I must say it is that it's the same as some of the universities is that they've got a criteria of artists which they've been embedded around them which they promote so BAME artists don't get that same level uh, of um, promotion um, I mean we can pick out one name let's say Grayson Perry everybody knows Grayson Perry who's on, a, on an art course and I love his work and I love the guy but there's other artists out there as well on the same sort of tier as him. And I was researching and I found, and he's not a black glass blower, he's a, he's a, he's a I would say a sculpturist as well, Fred Wilson, and he's from um, America. But he went to culture the same as you, Max, and that's where he fell in love with glass. And so, but he wasn't, he wasn't technically able to produce what he wanted to produce, although he knew what he wanted to produce. So he got other artists to do it for him. Yeah. And he came, he, he's, he's a well-established artist in America. And this guy, I, I like, you know, I'm in awe of, he, he actually, looking at his uh, images, encouraged me to do more of a political statement than just an artistic base uh, matter. And it gave me the, yeah, it gave me the confidence to, to actually produce something that was saying something. And talking to Ale, um, talking to Paul McAllister, you know, he says to me once, he says, Chris, if you're going to say something, say something. Don't mess about and just say it. And that's what I've tried to do in some of my artwork is that, you know, some of the things that have gone in in the past, you know, the historical brutality to African-Americans and Africans is just unbelievable and to try and put that into an art context it's um 
it's a, it's it's a, it's, a, it's sometimes a hard job to do, you know, emotionally and physically. You know, how can you turn something that's perceived as something that's quite exquisite and beautiful as glass, and then trying to turn that on its end and make it horrific and brutal when it still's got the image of something that's really ornate and nice. Um, so yeah, um, that's what I've tried to do with my art is um, have this conversation, not just with me and the subject matter, but the conversation between the glass, the ceramic, the copper work, and whatever element I bring in, you know, all, all the elements that I bring into the artwork have got to have a conversation. It's, it's a waste of time having a piece of glass, a piece of metal, a piece of wood, and putting them onto a table and expecting them to all resonate and adhere to each other. It's got to be this, um, they've all got to sort of like marry and float into each other and try and make, you know, some sort of conversation piece yeah. without each one of them sort of like shouting out the most. And um, I'm still trying to do it. And uh, yeah, just love enjoy well, playing. You're obviously doing it very well. I mean, <laughs> what, what, what drew you to Wolverhampton School of Art? You know, what, why have you chosen glass and ceramics as, as your kind of mediums to work okay. in the media? I suppose it all, well, it all started with my wife. My wife was studying at Wolverhampton anyway, doing a sociology degree. Yeah. And um, she says to me one day, she says, you've got to go to university. And at that, and it, you, you've got to. And when my wife says, you've got to, you've got to. So I thought, well, I grew up with the wrong kind of um, uh, people telling me what I can do. I got more told what I can't do. I got told I can't do a lot of things. So I grew up with this image of university being somewhere where, at the, when I was growing up, only the posh people or the well-educated people could get into. So I had this, this feeling of, I'm not worthy to actually even go to university. And even, even if I do, I'm just gonna fail. So it was a place that was very daunting for me to even go into. And, um, but I took the steps, I went in on an open day and I thought, I haven't got a portfolio of work. I'll just go in, I'll please my wife. They won't upset me and I can go back to doing do my plumbing and eating and uh, looking after the kids. But unfortunately, Paul McAllister said, um, yeah, we'll give him a go. And um, yeah, it was um, it was like looking around the studios. When I looked at the, the, um, the metal workshops and the wood workshops, I've already done that. I've been into construction for 20 odd years. I've been into engineering for 10 years. And um, it was a thing and a, and a material that I've always worked with. But when I came into the glass and the ceramic studios, there were materials I'd never had the chance to work with uh, or never even given the opportunity to work with. So that drew me at first. I didn't even know if I could do anything with these materials, but I thought, you know, just to be able to work with the facilities that were at the university was just uh, an opportunity I couldn't miss. And so that's why I chose the glass and ceramic course. And then, um, you know, as soon as I started to um, work with these materials, the actual materials and the um, degree course I was on started to resonate with who I am as a person. So me being of mixed race, Jamaican and white, was that I was on a glass and ceramic course. And the course itself, glass and ceramic, glass doesn't really sit well with ceramic and vice versa you know you, it's very hard to get the two and it's very hard for artists they either go one way or the other because the the two genres are very technically um grafting on your abilities to hone it all in so it's easier just to hone in on one than try and take both on board but me being me i wanted to take both on board because of this being mixed race i thought why can't i be both why can't I be a glass and ceramic artist? No, I mean, it is extraordinary the way that you have melded the two materials together in pieces of work, you know. I, I rarely see that. And, um, you know, I think it's quite laudable that you're able to do that, you know, very easily, it seems. Well, I don't know about easily, Max. It's... Um, well, I mean, it's, it's yeah. a hard one, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's a hard it's, one route for you. Yeah. I know I've, that. Yeah, I, I think the one is, you know, it, nothing nothing is easy. I think if I was a brain surgeon, I'd be pretty good because I'd keep trying. There might be not many people alive, but I'd have a go. And it's a bit like, you know, throwing. People can go on, a, on the ceramic course, they'll start throwing. 
and it's hard. It's a hard technical ability to achieve. And I think because you can't do it first time, a lot of people give up. And the same with glass blowing, you know, gathering glass, it will end up on the floor. Your first, you know, gather will perhaps end up on the floor or in the door. Or as uh, Simon still says, I still get it stuck on the doors now. You know, it's, it is a hard element to control. So, you know, but you haven't got to give up. It's, it's like everything. We didn't, we didn't start life walking. You know, we had to learn how to walk. And it's, the, it's the same with these, these materials. You have to learn how to use them. And learning how to use them, you haven't got to try and fit the box that all artists have, tried, have, have done, done in the few, in the past. You know, everyone's got this um, set of rules which we've got to follow, and we've got to to be able to actually use the materials in the first instance. But then, once you get the slightest ability and a little bit of control, then perhaps let that control go out of control and use it to your ability then and try and find where this material and you fit together. Don't try and perhaps fit you into the material as such and trying to get this material to do something that your abilities won't be able to do at that time. Just enjoy the time of making and experimenting. And through that experimentation, perhaps you'll find something like what I have done, you know, out of, um, I would say my ability is not as good as some, but I've used that ability to try and enjoy what I make. And I, I love every time I'm in the glass hop shop. It's like Christmas day, you know, even if something doesn't work out, it's just that experience and that experimentation that perhaps brings you to something else further on. And the only way you're going to get better is keep, keep having a go. So well, you, you seem to have developed your own language in glass making, glass blowing, uh, glass fabrication. I mean, tell us about your work. I mean, this is a good point. You know, wh where does it derive from? What is its thinking? And um, what is the conversation you're having with an audience? You talked about having a conversation with an audience. You know, what, what are you trying to say through the work? I mean, we can see pieces of your most recent work behind you on your left shoulder. You know, t tell us about it. Okay, so obviously, uh, being at university, you've got to start researching um, a topic. And um, when I first started, I thought my topic would be plumbing and heating, of course. So I started, and there's one, there's one in the um, in the studio space at the moment in the cupboard, and it's it's like it, I called it my plumbing tree. So it started off with uh, aspects of uh, plumbing materials and water coming out of it, but. That was me trying to find myself as a person which wasn't the person I was trying to find at all. Um, and then I started thinking, well, if I've got to do, start to do dissertations and research, let's research something I'm really interested in. And that was my heritage. And, and my heritage is tainted with two sides, really, being mixed race and the slavery aspect. Um, and so I started off with the foundations and I should have, perhaps I should have gone even further back into history and, you know, before slavery. But I thought um, with the brutality that's in the world and the oppressive way that black people have been treated, I think if I started to try and highlight all the good that had happened before slavery, it wouldn't have, it wouldn't have evoked the emotions that I have today. So I started with slavery and obviously looking at um, the sugar industry, the, uh, the transatlantic slave trade, and aspects of how they just lynched millions of black people from Africa just to use them as a commodity to produce sugar to feed the rich in their, in their tea rooms and having their tate on tays and cups of coffee and uh, cake. Um, I can't. I can't still believe today that you know people die for sugar. It's just. It's just. It's obscene and absurd. And the further you look into it, you know, to to actually get these people over into the plantations, um, shoving them into ships, and you know, and if they couldn't quite make the transatlantic trade, uh, slave um, uh, triangular passage is that they'd throw them overboard. You know, just, you, just, just like you'd throw something of not use. These, these people were people, but they were just, they were dehumanized 
and not even recognized as being human. Um, so all these emotions um, started off with that foundation of slavery. And then you start to look at, you know, the civil rights, you know, the movements that happened there, segregation, um, South Africa, you know, the, the list is just endless of where you can get your inspiration from the, um, the incarceration and the divide, discrimination, people using people as property, um, you know, just the brutality. Um, it's, it's all out there to be used as um, a structure to build on what I've been, what I've been making. And I wish I wished it wasn't there. I wished I could make pretty things, but unfortunately, um, I think I've got to make. I didn't think I was going to make these, but I've got to make these to have that conversation. And that's what the work's about: is having this conversation, and and not in a. Although the work's political, it's not taking a political stance. Is where is that you're right and I'm wrong? Because me being mixed race, I've got two parts of my heritage, and I can't. I'm like the middle the middle ground. So, you know, part of my white ancestry might be that they were slave owners and then my black side was slaves. So, you know, me being in the middle, I've got to be responsible to try and have this conversation in a polite manner and perhaps a reconciliation of what's happened in the past and try and get people to re-engage with what's happened to perhaps change the future a little bit or just change the mindset of people. You know, people are always quick to say, you know, um, uh, black people have done this or it's because of this or it's because of that. But all them questions have got an answer of what's reached that point in time. And that point in time relates back to history, how they've been oppressed, you know, even going back to a teaching level, is that uh, slaves weren't even allowed to read and write. So when you're not allowed to read and write, how are you exposed to get anywhere? Um, and that's just at a base level, you know? So um, yeah, we just gotta keep on making work that talks a conversation and hopefully people will, you know, even, even if they look at, you know, look in the history book and just find something that they didn't know, you know, there's names like, um, uh, my favorite one is obviously Emmett Till. You know, there's lots of people I talk about. I've got a piece called Emmett Till and you'll say, have you heard of him? And they don't know, but that conversation then enlightens them and they'll go and, you know, you'll tell them a brief story and then it gives them the chance to go and investigate it themselves and find out the true horrors because there's a lot um, that's on the television at the moment with this um, Black History Month. Um, unfortunately, it's 11 o'clock at night. So uh, I don't know if that's because of what it's about. I don't know if it's how, why they've put it so late, but there's a lot of, um, I would, it's, it's a horrible phrase, but they whitewash the actual true facts of what happened during the slave trade. Um, and uh, the one that's on at the moment with Samuel Jackson, you know, it seems very, very, um, yeah, uh, orchestrated of, of what it's about it should be it should be showing the really bad stuff but it's not it's just it's, it seems a lot cleaner your your work is incredibly visceral and challenging i mean in past discussions we've had you you've said to me and i paraphrase here and i'm sorry if i get this wrong that the conversation you have with an audience should always be a two-way one and there's little point in screaming in someone's face the message but your work is very screaming in your face it is unfortunately with strange fruits a high which is a highly emotive piece about the lynchings in the u.s and the southern states i mean you, you produce something that's very provocative in its content and presentation and you know a lot of people find it very difficult to digest yeah I mean, how, how have galleries and audiences reacted to it? Have you had feedback from it? Um, well, yeah. I mean, if, if we started with Strange Fruit, that obviously that was a, um, a piece of work I did during my time at Wolverhampton, and it got into the Glass Biennale. And, and I can remember Simon Eccles saying, you know, don't think that the uh, Glass Biennale is going to be the all and end all of, of glass making. You know, it's, it's a nice experience to have. And 
I didn't really listen to him. So I thought, you know, I'm going to enjoy the experience, but I'm, I'm hoping that people interact and I'll get a little bit of promotion or I'll get somebody interested in the work. And yeah, I should have listened to Simon because um, I found that although people were sympathetic to the work and very interested in the work, there wasn't much interest in the work as in promoting it on even Instagram or Facebook or saying, you know, this works about this. There was no, there was no uh, promotion as in sh about the actual story about the strange fruit either. You know, there was perhaps an, uh, the odd image here and there. And um, why do you think that was? I think because it's, 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 it's a very political statement what I was making about lynching and the, and the arena that I was actually uh, exhibiting in was, let's say, 99% white. And does it sit right still? You know, although I'm in a really nice exhibition that I'm actually talking about stuff that could rub people the wrong way, um, how it's perceived. And, we, and, that's, and, that's, and that's what I wasn't trying to do, is trying to have that conversation. It's as if, and even if, if you do find a glimpse of my work on the internet, it's always in the background. So it's as if people didn't really want to publicise it. There was one lady, um, I forgot her name, but she's got a website called Style & Co. And she did a lovely piece on me. Um, and that was the only piece during the Biennale that was there. There was no radio interviews, there was no television, there was no journalist, there was no publicity at all. The only person I did have, and I'm so grateful that he took the onus to come up to me and give me his card, was Angel from Vessel Gallery. And to have somebody of his stature actually come and say that your work's very interesting, which, and at the time I didn't even know who this guy was, that's how raw I was to the, to the platform of Glass. Uh, for him to come up and say that, um, I was, uh, yeah, I say I was spellbound. And it took me a lot of courage to actually phone the person up and say, you know, um, shall I come down and we'll talk about his work? Because he's in a totally, it was in a totally different arena to what I was. You know, I was a young, well, not even young, but <laughs> as a student, I was a, I was a young student and he'd been in the, in, in the arena for so long that I didn't feel as if I was worthy of his presence sort of thing. Um, but when I went and I spoke to him and I was talking about the work and I was, I was, I was trying to find my way and ask questions like, should I change my style because of what it represents? Should I do this? Should I do that? Trying to find out if it would be okay to have an exhibition in his gallery. Does it warrant being anywhere in this, in this realm? Um, but he, 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 you know, he, he put me to right and said, no, you know, even if you take out what it's about, it sits well as a piece of artwork and you should be proud. And, um, you know, it, I still don't feel that proud, but I feel a bit better of understanding where it does sit in the, uh, the art world. It's not the same as um, David Chihuly or Elliot Walker. It's not the same as Catherine Schillings. It's Chris Day. And I think that's where you've got to try and find yourself is that I'm not trying to be somebody else or trying to fit somebody else's shoes. I've got my own shoes and these are what, this is it. And, um, you know, I, and he was right. I, sh I shouldn't change. And I was talking to um, uh, a guy that came to the exhibition. Um, he's, a, he's a lecturer at one of the London universities. And he could tell where I'd actually tried to produce work that was less provocative to try and fit that stage which I was being put onto. And he says, although it's still raw, it's not as raw as some of your other pieces. And I says, you're right. And he was pinpoint right in picking them out. And um, he says, just stick to what you're doing. And it was such a, a nice word, well, nice phrase for him to say, because I needed that encouragement to think, yeah, I'm, I'm, not on the right track as being famous or being successful, but I'm on the right track as an artist in fulfilling what I'm supposed to be trying to do. So um, yeah, um, that's 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 how I feel. I mean, you you have to be true to yourself. I mean, 
you know, speaking as a glass artist myself, who has been trolled online, and thank goodness you've not been trolled online. No, now, no, after I, this. I, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I find the glass community both embracing and rejecting at the same time. I mean, it, you know, with, without being rude to people, you know, the, a, a lot of the glass world is full of hobbyists and they tend to be kind of late middle-aged ladies, you know, who don't necessarily want to embrace difficult subject matter. Yeah. Yeah. But the point is difficult subject matter needs to be vocalized and it needs to kind of have an audience and it needs to have a gallery. And, yeah. you know, you seem to be doing it. Well, um, with alacrity, you know, and I, I think that what you're doing is incredibly powerful and will change the perspective. You know, even if we get more BAME students into this college, yeah. you know, and other universities studying the math material, then, you know, you've achieved something, if nothing else. Yeah, you know, I mean, I mean in that respect. definitely, Max. I mean, you can always have, you, you can remember the conversations I've had with yourself saying, you know, are there any students out there that are doing glass and ceramics and you said you know you, you perhaps know one or two but at least now yeah even even myself I used to google it you know uh, black glass blowers and all it used to come up was pictures of actual black glass but not an actual blower but at least now if somebody wants to google black glass blowers they've got my ugly mug to you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know so it, it it will make I'm hopefully hopefully it will make a change and I think it is that perception of seeing people out there you know you're saying why aren't there people of color doing um glass and I think if people can see people of diversity doing it it might just encourage them to do it you know it encourages people to be uh, rappers and singers and boxers and athletes so why not glass blowers or artists yeah. You know, you need that rep representation out there and you need people and faces to see. Because if you don't see them doing it, perhaps you can't believe that you can do it. Yeah, yeah. exactly. It's, it's, it's having something, you know, to hold up to. Yeah. Your new pieces, um, they seem to deal with personal identity rather than a collective one. Is that kind of correct? They seem to be more intimate. Yeah. And subtle in their approach. I mean... Is that right? Oh, am I wrong here? No, definitely, Max. I think doing the BA, it's like my, um, it's like my nursery time, and now I've grown yeah. up a bit, and I think I feel confident enough and old enough as well. You know, I'm 52, and being mixed race, I think it's only been going through university and going through this journey of researching my heritage and going through this, you know, up and down upheaval of everything that I feel comfortable of where I sit, although. My identity is quite um, complex. Um, I suppose my mental health issues around it are quite complex too. And trying to trying to fit in where you fit in has been a, a big journey of of my life. Is you know you're trying to fit into if you're in the workplace and they're all white people, you want to fit in and be one of the one of the guys. Or if you're um, anywhere, you know, any clubs or anything, you want to try and fit in. And it's a bit like with me, you know, I've, all my life I've tried to fit in somewhere, but I've grown up now and I'm thinking, well, no, I don't need to fit in. This yeah. is me. And uh, I've, I've done a piece called Anomic. And it's, it is, it's, it's, that's very, um, uh, it's an emotional piece for me because it shows two cages. And these are the two physical cages that I've gone through. So you've got the, um, the society's cage, which is them trying to fit you into an identity. And then you've got your own cage. And that's you trying to fit into an identity, which you can't really, you can't fathom out yet of where you fit. Because whichever part of that society you try to fit in, you get sort of like nudged out the way of, you know, you're not black enough or you're not white enough. And so you end up in this little circle of yourself. And, um, but now I feel that, um, I suppose with Black Lives Matters as well, is that this word black, you know, will it be, how is, how, who do you define as being black? What is black? Is it a word that should be erased from the history books now? Because we're that such a diverse community in the world is that who is truly black anymore? You know, and and who who should have that badge of being called black? 
Now, the only way I dealt with that was the one drop rule with the Jim Crow rules in America. And that was that there was, if there was a single drop of black blood, uh, that makes a person black. Um, so that's where I grew up with, and that's what I, I've stuck to that, yeah, I'm black because of obviously the racist uh, remarks that were thrown at me, um, society's way of judging me, the way the police will judge me. And um, so that's how I see myself as being black. But this identity crisis is that I've acknowledged the black side. But sounds like a Star Wars film, doesn't it? But um, I've not, um, I've not, I've not embraced my white side at all. And it's, I suppose, that might be another question I've got to do, or another piece of artwork I've got to do, is that I've grown up black. I look in the mirror and I see a black person. I don't see a white person. People tell me that I'm black and very racially motivated uh, ways. So. That's how I refer myself as being black. Now, there might be other people that have mixed race that don't want to, they're mixed race, their identity is being mixed race. And, um, but I'm, yeah, I'm still fighting it. It's, I've embraced, I've embraced being mixed race and I can talk about being mixed race, but um, I think I'm still saying that I'm black, but it might change, it might still change. Well, it's kind of a very interesting argument because, um, or observation really, because certainly the, the, the use of the term black is relatively generational in the United States. You know, there are other terms which have been used oh. this century, you know, for, for, for people of African American heritage. Um, and it has become a political thing. I mean, you might be right that, you know, things will change again. Yeah. And, um, you know, it, it kind of be, I think you're part of that argument, you know, part of that conversation. Yeah. You know, have, so, so where to next? Um, you know, apart from finishing your MA, what's the next move? You've got a year left with us. Oh, God. What think... are you going to be doing, Chris? And this is not a tutorial. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, I'm... You know, I mean, after three years and with everything that's gone on, like I say, I'm still, I'm still taking them baby steps, uh, Max. So yeah. I'm still, I'm, I shouldn't say, but I'm still, I should, you know, I'm on my last year in my MA, like you say, so I shouldn't be playing anymore. But unfortunately, I just got to play. So I'm, I'm, yeah. enjoy, <laughs> I'm enjoying, I'm enjoying playing, but I'm finding, and um, I'm finding that my artwork. Although the glass and the ceramics was the base of the beginnings and I was integrating the two is that with this mixed race thing is that I'm experimenting with different materials as well. I mean, first of all, it's the glass and then it's more into metal work as well. Um, um, you know, because metal work, I look at metal work and even if you take my construction side of the industry that I've been in, you know, you've got foundations which had metal in them, you know, this foundations of society, it's always got metal somewhere. So I just find now that being mixed, mixed race is that I'm trying to mix up elements into the glass as well. And, and elements that I've not used before. So I've always used copper, but in the metals now, I'm starting to use aluminiums and different foils. And, you know, I want to try, I want to try a plethora of, of different ways of, manipulating the glass i've only had this these certain few methods which which i think i've utilized to the limit at the moment so i've got to try and uh, build on my skills as a glass blower as well and how i can actually manipulate the glass because it's all about this manipulation of the material um, of how far i can actually push it and what things i can bring in to push that material as well you know, bringing copper in, it's got a, it's it's got a nice way of cooling down with the glass. It's not restricting it or or fracturing it. But who's to say, like Jane Cook when she came home over from America, is that why not have a piece of steel in there that actually shatters the glass? And that is the artwork. Why, you know, why yeah, not? Why why has everything got to be perfect? So, you know, I've produced pieces that have got little hairline cracks in them, but that's the, that, that's the piece of art as well. You know, 
Hopefully it's, it will last the, the, the course of time with this hairline crack in it, but who's to say that, that that crack isn't the tension that we all feel as part of the artwork? So as some would say, oh, it's a flaw, and it should be chucked into the bin. I'm, I'm trying to embrace these things that get chucked into the bin. So I'm going around salvaging bits of steel and anywhere that I find where I can find things that I could utilize because uh, James said it as well, you know, there's, there's enough stuff in the world without having to produce more, <laughs> more <laughs> you know, more so, yeah. Yeah, you know, yeah. so we, we, we're, produ you know, even as a glass artist, you could perhaps think, am I doing the right thing producing all this glass if it's just going to be stood in my shed or in my garage? And hopefully not, you know, hopefully lots of people will buy it or even if it just goes to exhibitions or galleries and people can have the conversation, uh, which, um, which would be brilliant. But, you know, I think if you can produce something and have a conversation as well as sell it, but I think the conversation is more important because that can, that can interact with far more people than somebody buying your piece of work and it's sitting in there front room or studio and and only having a small audience if a piece of work can go into a gallery space or an exhibition and it can it can communicate and get a conversation talking and a polite conversation as well um, i think it, that's what i'm trying to do and i'm trying to also you know through all this the glass making and finding out uh, inaccessible it is to people and I'm not, and I'm not saying it's colour related. You know, this is on a, this is on a status of somebody's got to be well off or have a good career behind them. I'm fortunate I've got a good career behind me that can subsidise me doing glass. Otherwise, I'd perhaps have to do like other people and revert perhaps to printmaking or performance or or some kind of other medium to produce work. Um, so I'd like to set up some sort of studio that's a community-based studio where we can we can bring people in just to have a go, you know, at either a reduced rate or a rate that's free if we can get some sort of funding established where a studio could be built and people can come in and work. And you could bring in other artists as well then to come and do the work. They could do work for themselves as well as teaching. Um, so yeah, that would be that would be my end goal. But um, you know, I've had a lot of goals in the last three months that I've surpassed, and I, I you know, I'm still I can't believe how far right. it has gone. Yeah, you've come a long way. Well, listen, thank you very much, Neil. I'm going to hand back to Claire because there, there are some questions for you. Okay. Uh, thank you so much, Chris. For talking. No problem, Max. It's been a pleasure as always. Well, likewise, Claire. Let me pass you back. Thank you very much, Chris. Okay. okay. You take care. Um. Okay, so uh, Chris, we've got one from Ollie Buckley here. He says, hi, Ollie Buckley from the uh, White House Co Museum. Yes. Uh, Uni of Wolverhampton and our museum are planning an exhibition about Bain Glatt artists after we open in 2022-23. Would Chris be interested in lending work or co-curating with us? Yes, definitely. That's, that's yeah, in fact, in fact I've, I've been talking to Ollie uh, just recently and... Um, and, it, and it's one of them things, isn't it? Like I was saying, the art and the materials and the nature of what we're trying to sell is quite, quite expensive. And he was, he was, as as a, um, an exhibition space, he was worried about the cost of having to try and buy a piece of work. And I and I suggested that um, perhaps you know we could go back to this old bartering system where I would supply a piece of artwork which they could put on display if I could use a studio at a reduced cost or use the space or do some teaching or do something. So instead of this money, money changing hands and just paying bills, we're both gaining something. They're gaining a piece of work. They can have a conversation to a wider audience and I'm getting use of the facilities. And also perhaps during that time, doing a demonstration to people that wouldn't perhaps see somebody of a vein uh, orientation doing this kind of work you know um, so yeah uh, no problem Ollie in the future I'd love to uh, do something great thanks thanks Ollie for that question um, this one is from Anonymous uh, I am a middle-aged female undergraduate fine arts student although not really a hobbyist returning to education late in life 
and have been swayed away from art by my parents as a teenager. Since my return to art, I was surprised to find that I'm really drawn to ceramics and glass the more I study. I believe that these materials have great scope to invite conversation on numerous topics. Mm -hmm. Through my studies and research, I have found that there is a shocking lack of availability to engage with glass as a medium. And I feel that this is something that isn't widely acknowledged. I applaud your commitment to the work and will be keenly following your career. So that's a really oh, brilliant. See, see, it's that same question, isn't it, that reverts back to being able to afford to do it. So, you know, we get we get dragged in or 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 pushed into doing these BAs and MAs in glass and ceramics, which we all love. We love the materials, we love working from them. And then like lemons, at the end of the course, we chucked off the cliff. And there seems to be no support for artists afterwards. Hopefully the university will change its role and sort of like give the MA students, the BA students, the opportunity to come in as, as they have done as, as, as artists in residence, but perhaps some, some other form of engaging with the artist just to keep their hand in. And perhaps, you know, in a way of, they'll come and produce some work and do some lectures, do some demos, do something. So it's, it's not this money thing, it's a bartering system again, and everybody will, will, um, gain something from it you know um and it's like i say it's this community-based um uh workshop which are which i think is needed because it's so expensive to do glass ceramic isn't isn't expensive but it's it's the apparatus you need you know i've got a wheel and a um a kiln in my garage and it's took my garage over but, you know, so if, if you wanted to do these in a community-based situation, you perhaps all have all these facilities around you and you haven't got to outlay all this expense. And some people can't get to grips with throwing, but they could do slab building and there'd be more on offer. So they aren't just stuck. I'm just stuck with my with my, my wheel. You know, I haven't got the facilities or roller to do slab building. Whereas if there was a place where you could try different things, then I think it would help a lot of people. It's that, co it's that idea of being co-productive, isn't it? It's, it's, yeah. just really, it's a really positive idea. Um, okay, thanks for that. Um, next one is from Pritpa. Fascinating talk. I was mesmerised and captivated by your very timely and important work when I first saw it at your degree show. I joked with Max about purchasing it. I couldn't afford it now anyway. Um, but can such important work ever be responsibly sold in your view? Yeah. This is another another dilemma I'm facing. You know, it's the, these last three months, I'm facing a lot of things that I didn't think I was, I didn't sign up for, basically. And this dilemma of, you know, the exhibition I've got down in London at Vessel, the work um, is uh, in an in an in a in an exhibition of high quality. It's surrounded by. Um, objects of high quality and then my objects refer to a price and my objects now have been put into that same category uh, to the point is like I can't afford my own work if I wanted to buy it and that 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 that's the dilemma is 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 where do I where do I feel that that is that one point of me I want to engage with people that can't afford to do this subject and, and get them to use these materials that I'm finding hard to use at a, at a, at a, a costing price. Um, but then again, I'm selling them at a really high price. And the only way I can get away from that is a bit, it's a bit like Robin Hood. That's how I feel is that, you know, you're taking money from the rich and the people that can afford to buy these objects and enjoy them and then give that back to the poor. But not as in poor as in they haven't got money, but more for the people that can't get to these materials, haven't got the, the chance to um, do glass, you know. So I think that's the only way I can feel good in myself is that, and I've said on um, a couple of occasions when I've done interviews, you know, if I sold a big piece, I would love to have a little fun put aside where I can go into a school when COVID's all over and we can interact a little bit better and get somebody who's not at the top of the game, somebody who's not hitting the high marks in the classroom, perhaps a bit of a trouble causer, somebody who's not, you know, not quite fitting in and not quite found himself as a, as a youngster and taking him to an environment where they've never been 
and just see where they perhaps could bloom in that kind of environment. And um, the money side of it would go out the window because it's that enjoyment of seeing somebody else flourish, which is, you can't buy that. And I think that's where the art side would help me get the money together to be able to do something like that in the future. So that's my, that's one of my end goals. And that's how I feel about the art is that, yes, I'm selling it. It's quite expensive, but it will help down the line somebody else, hopefully, in the future. Okay, thanks, Pritpal. That's a, that's a really good question. Um, this one's from Louise. Art is the ideal arena to discuss these difficult issues and no artist should feel that they need to sanitise for sensitivity. Mm. It's great that your work is not showing away and that it can be a catalyst for change and to open dialogue. Really interesting discussion, thank you. So that's, that's more a comment than a question. Um, and the next one is from Fijo, who, who um, did a talk with us earlier on. She just simply asks, would you collaborate? Of course I would. I'll collaborate with anybody. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, uh, and, I, and I think that's, I, I spoke to that earlier, is that I think as artists, and that's one thing I've missed at university, is that because there aren't many students there, you need that collaboration between different artists and what how they feel about things and what they can bring to the to your work and what you could bring to their work, how they feel about the world and how they use materials and how they see objects could be totally different to how you use things. And some things that you see, you'll miss out. And that's the good thing about the lecturers and, and the tutors is that they'll point out things that you can't see, which they can see. And, um, you know, that's what you've got to take on board. Some students don't like when people say things about their work, but all they're trying to do is encourage them to think a little bit wider and a bit outside the box and try and be like myself, be a bit brave in what you're actually making. You know, it's no good coming to university for three years and going out, oh, I can make a, a beaker or I can make a nice bowl because, yeah, you perhaps have the technical ability to do that. But in the whole scheme of things, if that's what you want to do, fine. But I think art, oh, like that lady just says, it's a way of having a conversation. And I think in this world of today, you know, art's got a, a, a big job to do to start conversations and lots of things. And I think it's the only way to start to have a conversation. You know, not many people like myself being dyslexic is that if I picked a book up, I just flick and look at the pictures to get some sort of feeling of what the book's about. And that's a bit like art. You can go into a gallery and some, some of the artwork doesn't even have an artist's statement. You're just looking at an image or what the artist has done to try and feel what they're talking about. And um, yeah, so definitely um, the art's got a lot to do on the conversation side. Okay, thanks for that. So this one's from Tom Hicks. Really inspirational talk, Chris. How you describe the feeling that university was something out of reach for you is still something that a lot of people still feel, um, particularly in this region. Hopefully an artist like yourself has the ability to break down these barriers. I think that's that's really mm -hmm. nice. I, I know that Tom works with a lot of students, so he would be as no, well yeah. to sort of make that comment. No, um, he's, a nice, he's a nice down to earth man as well when you get to talk to him, you know. So uh, we had a conversation and uh, I can remember it was in an exhibition that he was he was doing and I said how did you get in here and it was over at the Wolverhampton um, art gallery uh, because it was that how, how do you get into an establishment like this and um, it was by invitation and also I was talking to Phoebe um, Stubbs the other day and I asked I asked her uh, it's not Stubbs sorry it's Phoebe Cummings and I asked her the exact same question how did you get into this and she was doing a live demonstration not demonstration but a live art piece and we had a lovely conversation um, but it was still word and mouth. But how does that word and mouth get down to people that aren't in that arena, in that same, you know, yeah. source? So it's, it's, I think galleries, exhibition places have got to start doing their own homework and start going to the universities. I know we have open days and we have uh, the degree show, but they've got to come in and see what students are actually producing. and. Um, support them and get them into gallery spaces. Okay, thanks, thanks, Tom, for that one. Uh, this one's from Soraya. Um, where do you see yourself in the future? Hello, Soraya. <laughs> well, like I say, I've, uh, I'd like to see the the art side of me is starting to 
come out a lot more, but this this uh, ambassador role seems to have uh, got my, um, my 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 juices running now. I'd love to find myself, like I say, doing a community based studio, being some sort of ambassador, going to schools because somebody says, how can we get the Bain community to come to um, like glass areas? And I, I turn around and says, well, that's the wrong way. You've got to go to them. How can you how can you expect somebody from Birmingham in a deprived area to get on a train, get on a bus, and come to Stourbridge to come and have a look at a demonstration or an exhibition in something that perhaps they don't even know exists? It's up to the, it's up to people like myself and perhaps a, a a group is to get something and take that to the schools and do something. You know, we can get a mobile hot shop and take it there and give them an inkling of what is out there because some people perhaps don't even know what glass blowing is. You know, even when I'm talking to people that are perhaps educated, I say I'm doing glass blowing and they don't, they, they look at you gone out, what's glass blowing? So if you're expecting somebody who's between, you know, the ages of six and 16 to understand what glass blowing, when I'm talking to adults and they don't know it, then I think it's time for the industry as an art base to get up and get to these schools and, and, and integrate a little bit more in, instead of expecting them to come. I think that sounds like a fantastic idea. Um, so we've got one last question from Anonymous. Um, do you think that it's harder to get work exhibited or acknowledged when it's political or of a subject matter that causes people to feel uncomfortable? Definitely. I, I definitely think that is. And I think that's why um, the gallery spaces and um, exhibitions Go on the side of caution. So they'll buy, they'll they'll exhibit things that is going to be for the minor, for the majority, and not the minority. And if it's politically based, they don't want to be seen to be that way inclined. So if they side with the Bain community and Black Lives Matters, then you'll get all the people, all lives matter, complaining. And I don't think they want to be in that sort of arena. So it does, it does, it is a big, it is a big one to overcome. Um, but I'm hoping with what's happened with Black Lives Matters, what's happened with Vessel, I mean, for that guy to take on my work and show it to an audience, at, at, you know, I'm at the table and I've started to eat some of the food now. You know, I've got the Crafts Council that have been interested in doing stuff. You know, there's, there's lots of things that are happening and people are trying to engage. But I'm, I'm afraid that... My story is just one story. I bet there's thousands of stories out there similar to myself. I've just been very privileged to get where I have. But forget being glass and ceramic, there's going to be painters, there's going to be textile artists, there's going to be designers that have all gone through the same journey as myself mm -hmm. and, you know, haven't had that publicity. And I'm just thankful to God that I've had this opportunity and I'm trying to get as much as I can out of this to try and exploit what's happened and trying to get more people on board you know at a higher level as well and they are you know people are saying you know these people are starting to engage and morally or just to be pc i don't care you know any publicity is good publicity at the moment well that concludes the questions chris it's always a pleasure no it's lovely. Um, thank you congratulations on your achievements i mean it's just amazing and, and I, I for one I, you know i'm just on tender hooks waiting to see what happens to you next <laughs> it's just it's really exciting um thanks for sharing your story with us and max thank you so much for hosting um chris's work will be on display at the made in Wolves gallery at the university from january to march march next year so um, please remember to just come and have a look um, and you'll be amazed when you see it in the flesh. It's, it's unbelievable. Um, please stay with us if you can. Our next talk is coming up very shortly at 4.30 p.m. with the CEO of Women Acting in Today's Society, Marcia Lewinson. Please go to Eventbrite to register for this and on any of our other events. Thanks for watching. See you all soon. Bye.